So, dear participants, now we will begin with the first session of today. Um, now we have three very interesting papers that all deal with uh, various aspects of reproductive rights. So, first, I would like to introduce Denisa Kotroushova from University of West Bohemia in Pilsen Faculty of Law. And she will give us a presentation on the history of legal regulation of assisted reproduction in the Czech Republic. Vanessa, when you're ready, feel free to begin. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I will try to share my presentation. Thank you for having me here at this conference today. It is my honor to be here. And I would like you to, to present you uh, the topic of my presentation, which is history of legal regulation of uh, assisted reproduction in the Czech Republic. Uh, I would like you to take you through the very brief yet important and interesting history of this legal regulation and perhaps in the end try to compare different time versions of our legal regulation of ART and try to say which one of them was better, if it is even possible to say this. So first of all, I would like to try to determine uh, what is assisted reproduction. Uh, it is necessary to understand what it is in order to uh, talk about its history. We can find different uh, definitions of ART uh, if we look uh, into different international organizations as well as if we look into different legal regulations. However, one of them, one of the recent ones you can see in the presentation, uh, generally speaking, I could say that uh, assisted reproduction are a set of methods, uh, procedures, and uh, techniques that are used for handling human gametes and human embryos in order to uh, treat um, uh, infertility or subfertility issues of either couples or individuals. Uh, nowadays, our current uh, definitions uh, usually uh, count as uh, assisted reproduction or ART only modern methods such as IVF, which is in vitro fertilization, meaning that uh, it is a procedure uh, that involves uh, fertilization of gametes extra uh, corporal, meaning uh, outside of human body. Uh, whereas the older uh, techniques such as uh, artificial insemination or assisted insemination, or you can call it uh, intrauterine insemination, uh, which is um, inseminating, uh, which is a procedure in which a laboratory processed sperm are placed in the uterus uh, to attempt pregnancy, meaning inside of human body. And this uh, older method is usually nowadays being excluded from the definition of ART. However, as we will see in the Czech example, uh, not all definitions are the same. And we will see that the Czech definition uh, varies a little bit in those terms. So now I would like to, uh, you can see in the presentation, uh, some uh, dates, some milestones of ART in general uh, worldwide. Uh, before diving into the Czech history, it is good to look at the broader picture and see uh, how ART in, evolved in history is uh, on its own. We can see that its roots are dating as far back as to 17th century, when there were some first attempts or experiments with uh, artificial insemination, which is, as I had said, uh, the original and uh, easier uh, form of fertility treatment. The first experiments were uh, done uh, in animals, uh, especially in cattle and also in dogs. We can see that the first artificial insemination was done in 18th century uh, in a dog. Following those experiments in animals, so uh, those new knowledge was gained and uh, then used for treating human infertility. Uh, one very important date that uh, I think we all know is the year 1978, when the first baby was born through uh, IVF, uh, Louise Brown. Uh, following that, uh, for example, in 1985, an important international organization the European Society on Human uh, uh, Reproduction and Embryology was established. And in 1983, the first Czechoslovak IVF baby was born. And in 1992, the first Slovak baby uh, IVF baby was born. 
from the birth from the birth of first Czechoslovak IVF baby, we can uh, move uh, straight forward to the uh, regulation in Czechoslovakia and later in the Czech Republic uh, uh, on its own. Uh, as we saw, the uh, evolution in this field of medicine uh, concerning ART was pretty rapid. And even the uh, back then socialist uh, regime uh, could not uh, deny this um, evolution and had to deal with it. Therefore, in 1982 uh, was uh, introduced an ordinance of Ministry of Health, which uh, dealt with artificial insemination. The very same ordinance was uh, adopted a, a year later for the Slovak part of the Federation. Uh, it was in the very same version. Both of those regulations uh, were not uh, acts, were not uh, laws. They were on a lower uh, level, with a lower legal force. They were only implementing regulations to another act. Uh, you can see a definition of artificial insemination in, in the presentation. Uh, in that time, uh, there was uh, there, there was no definition of uh, artificial reproduction uh, on its uh, on its own. There were only artificial insemination because because of the back then knowledge. So uh, the only way how to treat infertility was to undergo uh, artificial insemination. And uh, as we can see from the definition, it was possible only for spouses. Uh, uh, both of those spouses uh, could undergo this uh, treatment only for uh, some medical reasons. Uh, uh, both of them also had to have uh, full legal capacity and uh, there were some age limits, uh, lower age limit arising from the condition of marriage and the upper age limit, uh, which was set only for the woman. And it was uh, said in the way that she could have uh, undergone this uh, treatment uh, up to 35 years old, or usually up to 35 years old. Uh, it was possible to use uh, either uh, the gametes of the spouse, uh, and therefore it was homologous artificial insemination, or it was possible to use donated gametes uh, from an anonymous donor, and then it was uh, heterologous uh, artificial insemination. Uh, the donation was uh, strictly anonymous, and there are also some uh, conditions for donors set down in this ordinance. And what is uh, quite interesting, in my opinion, is that uh, the donor could ask for some remuneration. This thing uh, was removed later. And uh, last thing which I would like to tell to this uh, ordinance is that uh, there was another amendment to uh, the Act on Family, which dealt with the possibility uh, of uh, denying of paternity in case husband had granted uh, uh, um, consent to artificial insemination of his uh, uh, spouse. Uh, what happened after this ordinance? Uh, for a very long time, nothing uh, actually happened. This uh, old ordinance from the 1980s withstand a lot of important uh, milestones in the Czech history, such as the Velvet Revolution, the uh, fall of the communist regime, then establishment of the uh, Czechoslovakia, again, and then again, uh, establishment of the separate uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia. And finally, in 2006, it was changed. Uh, we can all see that after all those years, Having uh, a regulation from 1980s in 2006 was pretty obsolete. Uh, therefore, in, two, in 2006, the first legal regulation was adopted and it was done uh, via amendment of the Act on um, Care of People's Health. Uh, there was finally a definition of uh, ART uh, in its new modern meaning. Uh, there was not only artificial insemination, but there were also other new methods such as uh, IVF. Uh, it was also possible to do uh, pre-implantation genetic testing. It was very limited. Uh, this testing was allowed only in cases where there was some kind of um, risk of uh, transmission of hereditary diseases on the future child. And uh, another big difference was in the uh, in the subject who could undergo this uh, medical treatment. 
It was newly defined as infertile couple, meaning a man and a woman who intends to underwent this medical service together. Uh, newly, uh, there was no marital status requirement. Uh, those uh, persons in this infertile couple uh, didn't have to be married. Uh, this change was also uh, supported by the High Court of the Czech Republic, uh, who, which uh, once dealt with uh, similar case uh, and uh, stated that unmarried couples could uh, actually uh, undergo uh, artificial insemination in the Czech Republic even before the force of this new um, regulation, meaning even before uh, the 1st of June 2006. Uh, what was similar? Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, it could be uh, uh, ART could be undergone only for medical reasons. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there were no real age uh, nor legal capacity limits. Uh, the only uh, age limit uh, was set on the side of women, and it was a subjective one. Uh, the woman should be uh, in her fertile age, which is a very uh, vague category and that can vary from woman to woman. Uh, it was also possible to donate gametes. Again, it was strictly anonymous. Anonymity had to be uh, reserved between the donor and the child, as well as between donor and the recipient, meaning the woman, uh, uh, actually uh, donor and the whole infertile couple. Uh, what changed uh, uh, dramatically was the uh, payment for donation. Uh, the donor could not ask any remuneration for uh, the donation. He or she could ask only for compensation for effectively spent costs. That means, for example, the travel expenses or uh, expenses uh, for um, the time spent in the, on the clinics or perhaps for some pain that he or she had to endure. Uh, again, there was uh, an amendment to the Act on Family, which dealt with uh, the possibility that uh, unmarried couples can uh, undergo ART. Uh, and there was the question, who can be child's father if, uh, if unmarried couple undergoes this medical service? And therefore, there, there was a, uh, an, a presumption of paternity set down in the Act on Family, which said that it would be the man who granted uh, consent to uh, artificial insemination of women. Uh, and last regulation, which we have still uh, in these days, uh, came after another six years. It is the Act on Specific Health Services, uh, which came into force on the 1st of April 2012. We can see that uh, in a few days it will celebrate its uh, 10th birthday. Uh, the legal definition of ART, which is used in this uh, new, uh, in this current reg regulation, is very similar to the one that was used in the previous one. Uh, from the uh, definition, uh, which you can see in the presentation, uh, we can tell that it is, again, uh, only from medical reasons as an infertility treatment. I would say that it is... Uh, also a subsequent infertility treatment uh, because in order to be able to uh, access ART, uh, infertile couple uh, has to go prior to this uh, through different uh, treatments which are not uh, or were not successful. Uh, it is also possible to uh, perform ART in order to uh, do some genetic testing or screening of the human embryo in order to prevent uh, transmission of uh, some hereditary diseases. And uh, again, there is the infertile couple, which is the only subject who can uh, undergo this medical service. The definition of infertile couple is the same. Again, it's the man and the woman who intends who intend to undergo this medical service together. Uh, uh, again, there's no marital status needed for those persons. But what has changed is the age and legal capacity limitations. The age limits are uh, set down only for the woman. Uh, on her side, uh, there are two ways of uh, limiting her age. The first one is again subjective uh, and the woman should be in her fertile age, which is a very vague category, as I said. Uh, the other limitation is objective, uh, her biological age, 
uh, could not be higher than 49 years old. Uh, on the side of men, there are no such limitations. And as far as the legal capacity goes, uh, there are again only limitations on the side of the woman. Uh, the woman can be limited in the legal capacity, but not in the way that she could not understand uh, this medical service and its consequences, as well as not in the way uh, relating to her parental responsibility. And there is nothing said about uh, legal capacity of the man. Uh, we have uh, donations possible again. Uh, it has to be anonymous. Again, the anonymity has to be kept between the donor and the child, as well as between donor and uh, the infertile couple. Uh, donors cannot receive any payment for their gametes or embryos. Uh, they can only receive some uh, reasonable compensation. Uh, there are as well some family law consequences in the form of presumption of paternity. Uh, this presumption is now being set down in the civil code. Uh, uh, this regulation was amended only once in, two in 2017, but uh, those changes were only minor uh, in terms of uh, uh, terminology which was changed uh, by the civil code. On the other hand, there was also one amendment which was rejected by the Czech Parliament. This amendment was from 2017 and it uh, aimed to remove the condition of uh, uh, infertile couple. The, am the amendment uh, uh, intends to open up uh, ART to all women uh, without any consent of the man. Uh, but this, this amendment was not successful. Other relevant acts uh, in terms of ART are civil code, act on health services, or for example, act on human tissues and cells. Uh, now I would like to make a little uh, excursion towards Slovakian regulation, which is also very important, uh, uh, mainly because we were for a very long time uh, uh, one uh, country alongside with Slovakia. Oh, as I mentioned before, uh, the very first regulation in Slovakia or uh, back then in the Slovak part of the Federation was the Ordinance of Minister of Health from uh, 1983. Uh, the question is, what happened after that? What happened next? Uh, did the Slovakian regulation evolve in the same way as the Czech one? The answer is not exactly. Uh, in Slovakia, uh, after it separated from the Czech Republic or even before that, nothing really has changed. Uh, they still have this uh, ordinance from 1983 in force. Uh, after uh, almost almost 40 years, they have still this very obsolete regulation. Uh, uh, therefore, we can all uh, agree that there should be some issues arising from this old and obsolete regulation. There are many issues, for example, the uh, determination of paternity issues, because they do not have any special uh, presumption of paternity. Uh, for another issues are um, who can access uh, artificial insemination, because they do not have legally ART. Uh, this problem was solved in 2007 uh, when uh, so-called uh, ordinance on donors was issued by the Slovak government, and this ordinance uh, mentioned above uh, other things, uh, partner donation. And uh, while interpretation, it was said that uh, not only married couples, but unmarried couples can actually access uh, artificial insemination in Slovakia. Another huge problem is uh, what methods are actually legal and possible in Slovakia. Uh, the legal regulation tells us only about artificial insemination, which is the most basic one. Uh, on the other hand, we cannot think that uh, in Slovakia, their clinics do not know the modern uh, procedures and modern techniques. They know them and they do them, they uh, perform them, but uh, it is only the de facto practice, not uh, the uh, legal, legally regulated one, which is, in my opinion, uh, not ideal. And uh, I I'm not Slovak, but I believe that their regulation uh, should change and they should be uh, updated. Oh. Uh, it is true that there was one amendment to the Slovakian regulation, but this amendment uh, was made only by a non-parliamentary party and uh, it didn't even uh, aim to update their regulation. 
it aimed only to uh, remove uh, the condition of consent of a man and uh, it aims to open up artificial insemination to any woman without the need uh, to be in the presence of any man. Oh, and last, uh, I'll, uh, I will go back to the Czech regulation and try to do the comparison, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning. Uh, it is true that to do such comparison is quite difficult because we have to take into consideration different cultural and historical background of those regulations. However, I will try to do it from different points of view. Uh, the first one and very important one is age and legal, legal capacity. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, it is different for women and men. Uh, nowadays, uh, women have uh, age uh, and legal capacity limits, and back then, uh, in the previous regulation, there were no legal capacity limitations for women. Uh, and in the very first regulation in the ordinance, uh, there actually was a much uh, stricter legal capacity requirement. Uh, what I think is very uh, uh, crucial is that there is no legal capacity for men nowadays. In uh, this point of view, I believe that uh, the very first regulation in the ordinance was uh, quite better than uh, the current one, because it set down that the man has to have full legal capacity. Uh, if we don't have legal capacity requirement for the man today, it can cause various problems, especially uh, in the way of determination of paternity, because uh, this, pres this presumption of paternity uh, is bound to granting consent to artificial insemination. It is a judicial act, and uh, because it is a judicial act, we can it can have many errors. And uh, if we uh, spot any error, and if we uh, uh, then say that this uh, judicial act, meaning granting consent to artificial insemination, was invalid, we can therefore uh, uh, so discard uh, all paternities that were just uh, determined. Uh, another point of view may be from uh, the marital status. Nowadays, there is no problem with the marital status because both married and unmarried couples can access ART. However, it was not uh, always like that. We saw that the first regulation had uh, ART artificial insemination only for uh, married couples. And the uh, last uh, possible point of view is the more general one. It is the legal definition of ART uh, in general. Uh, we saw that the current regulation from the International Glossary from 2017 is um, focusing more on the modern techniques and it excludes uh, artificial insemination from its scope. Uh, the Czech definition, however, is a little bit different. Uh, uh, section 3, subsection 3 of uh, the Act on Specific Health Services today defines artificial insemination to be understood as intrauterine insemination or in vitro fertilization. We can see that this definition is a little bit contrary to the international one. Uh, however, I don't think it, may, it uh, causes many problems uh, in practice. So, to conclude this presentation, uh, I would say that uh, fertility medicine, uh, as well as uh, ART, uh, is very important and a very promising field of medicine. Uh, the Czech regulation is uh, keeping up to date with this uh, uh, evol evolving uh, regulation. Uh, even though it's not 100%, for example, in terms of this uh, definition of ART, uh, it is uh, much further than, for example, the Slovak one, which is lagging terribly. Uh, uh, we can also uh, uh, we can also say that uh, even though we would guess that the newer regulation would be automatically better than the older one, it doesn't always have to be that way. Especially if we look at the condition of legal capacity uh, that the persons in uh, the infertile couple has to uh, fulfill. Uh, that would be all for me for, uh, for today, and I would like to thank you for your attention and thank you for the opportunity for the opportunity to be here today, and I wish you a um, nice rest of this conference.
Thank you, Denise, very much. This was very interesting. Um, now I will give a word to our next participant, Arina Alexandrovna Sasova from Belarusian State Economic University Faculty of Law, and she will be talking on the topic of types of assisted reproductive technologies in the Republic of Belarus. Arina, feel free to start. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so today yeah, I will talk about types of assisted reproductive technologies in my country, in the Republic of Belarus. Uh, so, all over the world, there are a large number of married couples who don't have children for various reasons. Infertility is one of the medical and social problems that affect the demographic development of any state. However, with the development of science and technology, thanks to the achievements of world medicine, with the help of assisted reproductive technologies, many childless married couples can find the happiness of partnerhood. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, today, the legislation of many states provides for the possibility of using methods of assisted human reproduction. The history of the formation and development of methods of assisted reproduction has come a long way. The first available assisted reproductive method was surrogacy. The possibility of using the surrogacy procedure was mentioned even in the Code of Hammurabi. So, for example, uh, this act provided for the possibility of giving birth to a child as a slave in the event that the wife is barren. The slave woman for the birth of a child to a married couple received a kind of social uh, guarantees expressed in a ban on her sale, even in the case of her arrogant behavior. Until 1986, the traditional method of surrogate motherhood was used when the egg of the surrogate mother herself was fertilized with the genetic material of a man, the future biological father of the child. The world's first surrogacy in the form in which it's used now was carried out in 1986 in the United States. A woman who had her uterus removed asked to give birth to her close friend. The first state among the countries of the Commonwealth of Independent States where surrogate motherhood was implemented was Russia. The first case was carried out in 1995 in the St. Petersburg, but the method uh, of surrogacy didn't immediately become widespread due to its high cost. Uh, in the Republic of Belarus, at the legislative level, uh, the possibility of concluding an agreement and implementing the method of surrogate motherhood appeared on, uh, in August 2006. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first in vitro fertilization method was successfully implemented in 1976 after several hundreds uh, unsuccessful attempts british biologists uh, patrick steptoe and robert edwards achieved the first artificial pregnancy in a woman and in july 1978 louise brown was born the world's first person conceived in a test tube uh, the next please uh, soviet scientists also dealt with infertility issues and in 1986, the first test tube baby appeared in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Subsequently, domestic specialists improved their technique, and on the 26th of November in 1995, the first girls in Belarus were born, conceived in vitro. This day can be considered the beginning of the history of Belarusian reproduction. Uh, the next, please. Uh, one of the obligatory participants in legal uh, relations related uh, to the use of assisted reproductive technologies are healthcare organizations. Uh, they ensure the provision of quality medical care, since health protection is a priority area of government policy. Um, the use of assisted reproductive technologies is carried out by health care organizations that have a special license since works and services in the field uh, in the field of obstetrics and gynecology are a licensed type of activity. Uh, the next please. Uh, nowadays, in the Republic of Belarus, according to the law of the Republic of Belarus on assisted reproductive technologies, is legally enshrined in three types of assisted reproductive technologies, which are provided by healthcare organization, in vitro fertilization, surrogacy and artificial insemination. However, the analysis of the services provided by the centuries of assisted reproductive medicine 
in the Republic of Belarus allows us to conclude that other types of assisted reproductive methods are used in our country, despite the absence of their legal regulation. For comparison, let's turn to the legislation of the Russian Federation, for example, where according to order of the Ministry of Health of the Russian Federation, a more extended list of uh, applied types of assisted reproductive methods are proposed, namely in vitro fertilization, surrogacy, artificial insemination, husbands or donor cells, uh, injection of sperm into the oocyte cytoplasm, cryopreservation of germ cells, tissues of reproductive organs and embryos, transportation of germ cells, and issues of uh, reproductive organs and assisted hatching. Uh, the current stage of human development is characterized by the need to search for new opportunities to ensure the progressive development of the economies of countries and regions. The introduction of innovations in medicine and healthcare is one of the main factors in the social and economic progress of any country. Medical technology doesn't stand still and is constantly improving. Among the current methods of our common infertility, in addition to those enshrined in the law of uh, assisted reproductive technologies, are injection of sperm into the oocyte uh, cytoplasm, uh, intracytoplasmic injection of morphologically normal sperm, dissection of the embryo membrane, hatching. Uh, the first method, injection of sperm into the oocyte cytoplasm, is a procedure in which several sperm cells most capable of fertilization are introduced into the cytoplasm of the female gamete. This is one of the assisted methods of artificial semination. Uh, this technology involves manual selection of the most active and viable, viable sperm and its introduction directly into the egg by micro-injection. This approach is effective in, even in cases of male infertility. The essential difference between uh, this method and in vitro fertilization is that during in vitro fertilization, embryologists mix prepared sperm with eggs and their fertilization occurs naturally. And with the injection of sperm into the oocyte cytoplasm, the material is selected by the embryologist using high-tech equipment. The prepared mixture is forcibly injected in the egg cell using a micro needle. In order to increase the efficiency of fertilization uh, and the onset of pregnancy, medical institutions of healthcare uh, carry out the intracytoplasmic injection of morphologically normal sperm. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, this technology is a significant improvement uh, in the um, injection of sperm into the oocyte cytoplasm and is based on the micro-injection of a carefully selected morphologically healthy sperm cell into the ovum cytoplasm. Uh, with the injection of sperm into the oocyte cytoplasm, uh, the microscope is capable of magnifying an image by 400 times, while high pre precision equipment with the intracytopl uh, intracytoplasmic injection of morphologically normal sperm uh, is capable uh, to magnify up to 400 and uh, 4,400 times. Uh, consequently, uh, painstaking selection of material is much more careful, which leads to higher rates of effectiveness of the procedure. Uh, the successful onset of pregnancy largely depends on the ability of the embryo to implant, that is, to attach to the wall in the uterus. The next slide, please. It depends not only on the quality of the embryo, but also on the state of its outer shell. Uh, under natural conditions, after fertilization of the egg, the embryo develops for some time inside the shell remaining from this cell. On the fifth till seventh day of development, before attachment to the wall of the uterus, the embryo membrane is ruptured and shed. This process is called hatching. Uh, however, for a number of reasons, the hatching process can be disrupted. The embryo locked inside the shell doesn't have the ability to implant, penetrate into the wall of the uterus, and pregnancy doesn't occur. In order to increase the chances of a successful pregnancy in in vitro fertilization cycles before transferring the embryo into the uterine cavity, medical institutions of healthcare perform an artificial dissection of the embryo membrane. 
hedging. Despite the lack of legal regulation of these assisted reproductive methods, at present, uh, injection of sperm into the oocyte cytoplasm and uh, intracytoplasmic injection of morphologically normal sperm and hedging procedures are carried out by non-state healthcare institutions in the Republic of Belarus. Uh, next, please. Uh, in conclusion, taking into account the analysis of the market uh, for medical services in the field of reproductive medicine, we consider it expedient. And uh, the following types of uh, assisted reproductive methods uh, should be in our law. In vitro fertilization, surrogacy, artificial insemination, uh, injection of sperm into the oocyte cytoplasm, dissection of the embryonic membrane hatching, and intracytoplasmic injection of morphologically normal sperm. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Arina, very much. Uh, just a second. I lost the program. <laughs> so now, last but not least for this session, uh, I present Danica Karamarković from University of Belgrade Faculty of Law, and her topic is legalization of surrogacy for commercial commercial purposes, legal aspects. Thank you, Prof Professor, for introducing me. I just want to say a little disclaimer. Uh, my computer just right now stopped working, so I have to go without my phone, but I don't have a presentation, so I think that's all right. Uh, before I start, I just want to say that I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity to be part of this conference for the second time. Uh, also, uh, I would like to say that um, I'm, like I said, I, like I was introduced, I'm going to speak about legal aspects of uh, commercial surrogacy. So I listened very carefully to Denisa and Arena's uh, presentations. They were very nice. Uh, and I'm going to try my best not to speak about the same uh, things they already mentioned. So before I start, I would like to say why I chose this topic in the first place. So surrogacy is an arrangement in which a woman, the surrogate, agrees to carry and give birth to a child on behalf of another person or a couple, the attended parent. So as already Denisa and Arena mentioned, there is a two types of surrogacy. There is a traditional and there is gestational. Uh, also, um, like there, Denise already mentioned, uh, the, the important years for uh, the surrogacy. Uh, one of the first most important years is 1978, and it was the year when the first uh, IVF uh, or in virtual uh, fertilization was accomplished. So it was uh, the first baby was born, it was named uh, Louisa Brown. Then in the 1980, uh, the first legally compensated surrogate, Elizabeth Kane, was uh, created. And then uh, in 1976, we have the first uh, surrogacy uh, trial of the co contract that was made by Noel Kane. Uh, so we have that in 1985, the first successful gestational surrogacy. So gestational surrogacy is very important for the topic of commercial surrogacy because uh, it divided uh, the, the divided between uh, the surrogate mother and the genetic connection to a child. So as uh, Arina mentioned, uh, Hammurabi Code was also mentioning a type of surrogacy. That type of surrogacy, it is um, that in one of its um, parts, it mentions that a husband could bring another female to give him another child. Uh, and it's not considered a woman, uh, it's not considered as a wife, it's considered as a woman bearing a child for them. And also a wife could bring a man to uh, his, her man, uh, her husband, uh, and a child to, uh, to, to carry on and continue a family. So we have two types of commercial surrogacy. We have in surrogacy in general, we have altruistic and we have commercial surrogacy. So when it comes to altruistic one, and it's very self-explanatory, it is without any compensation uh, during the act of surrogacy. And when we're speaking about commercial surrogacy, it is uh, requiring some type of payment. Uh, when it comes to altruistic surrogacy, also it can contain payment in a way of having um, a payment for um, some normal expenses, such as medical expenses and expenses that require uh, being of the duty of work and such as that. So the first question is why people choose surrogacy in the first place? 
Well, it's quite obvious. Infertility is a big problem. Uh, approximately 6.7 millions of couples and uh, people are having a problem with infertility. Also, uh, nowadays we have um, a bigger problem with uh, homosexual people because they are gaining their rights. Uh, and uh, with their rights for to, to form a family, they are also having the rights to form um, children and to form a family. Um, then we have also um, people who don't have ability to procreate and uh, they can be con connected to any kinds of illness that is enabling them to pro procreate. Also, the next question is why women choose to become surrogates. First of all, it contains its altruistic uh, way uh, that is for a greater cause to help uh, families and to help them uh, gain um, have the ability to have families. Uh, also, another thing is a financial reasons in order to uh, gain uh, money. And um, also, uh, one of the reasons that was mentioned in one of the researchers uh, was that carrying a pregnancy is uh, pleasing for women and they enjoy it. So they, 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 they find the combine the greater cause with it. So um, we are now speaking about three cases. We have the baby M case, we have the baby uh, Gammy case, and we have baby Margie case. So uh, these are the very important cases because they open the problems with the uh, commercial surrogacy and surrogacy in general. With baby M case uh, that was happening in 1985, uh, we have Mary Beth White that um, actually uh, agreed for a commercial agreed for a service that included traditional way. So she was uh, having genetic connection to a child. And then later on, uh, after giving birth to a child, she wanted to declare a child as her own. And after a long trials, uh, they um, thought that the, the best intention for a child is to give them to their intentional parents. Then the second case for baby Gammy, it is about the twins uh, that were uh, again uh, involved in the surrogacy and one of the twins, uh, baby Gammy, had a Down syndrome. And because of its inability, parents didn't want the second child, they just wanted the one child. So they supposed that uh, the one child should be aborted. Uh, the women who carried the child, the surrogate, didn't want to abort the child and she gave birth to baby Gammy, but it is a huge problem who, after uh, arrangement, after a, a contract, who get, gets permission to have a parenting and what is after that uh, the uh, permission of, uh, of a parent to not, um, to not follow the contract. And also on the other side, um, a women not to, a certain women has a duty to um, think about it and do something about it. The next one is baby Margie. It is a problem with citizenship uh, because it, it was between Indian and Japanese parents. Um, Indian was a surrogate and the Japanese were the, the parents of the, ch of the next child that was supposed to be born. Uh, and the problem was that the Japanese parents in between uh, the surrogacy process, they divorced. And uh, a, w a wife that didn't have any connection to uh, genes with the baby didn't want a child. So the problem was that um, problem was that only a wife that was a mother could um, take responsibility for a child, and it was then a problem, and uh, it was it was uh, causing a lot of troubles to it. And uh, in the end, it's still debatable what happened. Then we have um, problems that involve the uh, European Union and how European Union is dealing with surrogacy. In general, European Union is against surrogacy because uh, in the Convention of Human Rights, it is very well declared that um, human body and parts of the human body shouldn't be used uh, as a financial gain. So uh, as a cause for a financial gain. And because of it, um, it is in most of the country a band. Uh, when we're talking about commercial surrogacy in particular, uh, it is in most of the countries of the world uh, banned. In some of the countries, uh, only altruistic surrogacy is allowed. And the countries that are having the most uh, free and most the best uh, laws that are uh, involving commercial surrogacy 
uh, include um, Russia, include Ukraine, and, Ukraine, and uh, some parts of the uh, United States, uh, especially California. So when we're speaking about um, how the surrogacy uh, and the mothers of surrogacy are um, declared in uh, Russia law, we have that in 1955, as Alina mentioned, uh, it was the surrogacy was allowed. And in 2011, we have a commercial uh, surrogacy law. Uh, also, um, it is solved in a way that um, a wife, uh, a surrogate is uh, actually having um, an ability to uh, gain parenthood after, uh, after giving birth to a child, but she is uh, having 72 hours uh, to decide whether she wants to uh, continue uh, bearing a child and having a parenthood after them or not. Um, and most of the times it is a bigger problem with the parents not accepting surrogacy and changing contracts after uh, birth of a child than it was uh, a problem with the women. Also, uh, there are some uh, things about surrogate mothers. They should be between 20 and 25 years. They should be healthy and they should have no genetic uh, connection to a child. So it's mostly gestational uh, connection. Also, uh, in 2021, it was um, very well declared that there is no place for a uh, homosexual community uh, to adopt and to um, involve in surrogacy. When we're speaking about United States, um, the good part about the United States that is uh, clarifying is that citizenship. Uh, it is well declared and uh, every child that is born in the United States uh, will have the citizenship of America. Also, also it is a convention of the child that it protects um, a, a lot of child's um, rights. Uh, also in Florida and Virginia are the two countries that are solving uh, surrogacy the best way. Um, and that is because, first of all, we have the genetic connection between a uh, child and intended parents. Also, surrogate has 48 hours to decide whether she wants to keep a child or she wants to, as the contract said, give it to intended parents. Uh, the problem was also in India. We have a specific case that in 2002, it was allowed to have a, a commercial surrogacy. And then in 2015, it was prohibited because we have the problems of uh, thinking that it included too much of uh, usage of women and uh, exploitation. So the problems with that could occur with uh, contract laws are basically made from the medical protection uh, that the women are not enough protected uh, in a medical way. Also, it can be changed that um, if something happens between the intended parents, they divorce, if some one of them dies, what is going to happen afterwards? Also, the problems of citizenship. A lot of babies are left dead without the citizenship, and it's uh, in the prevention of a child. Uh, it is uh, very well declared that child should have their uh, rights to citizenship. Uh, also, we are the child's best interests that are again declared in a uh, convention of the children uh, are not very well so far. Um, Sold. Also, we have the dark future of uh, crime that was, uh, it's because most of the countries don't allow surrogacy and because they don't allow surrogacy in general, altruistic, but also commercial surrogacy, we don't really know how much of the crimes and how much of the usage of women, of the child's abuse are used between it. Uh, also, um, the best way to um, really understand this is because uh, to uh, use that in, in conclusion, uh, system has to work and it has to find a way to regulate the laws and it has to find a way to defend the, um, the, the parts of the system, the, the parts of the like children and women that could be uh, used and also they have to keep track with medicine and evolution uh, and uh, to declare more uh, specifically and formalize how it's gonna, um, the, the future rights of the humans uh, that are involved in surrogacy can be uh, sold. And also I would like to finish with the cons saying human beings should be treated as an end in themselves 
and not as a mean to something else. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Danice. And with this presentation, we have concluded this last session. So now I'm up opening um, discussion. If anyone has any comments, questions, etc., now is the time to ask. You can, uh, of course, raise your hand or type it in the chat. Nina. <laughs> Sorry, but since there are no questions, I can't resist mentioning one thing that's been bothering most of us in the organizational committee when we were reading the abstracts, and that's classifying the uh, slave woman in Hammurabi's code as a surrogate mother. I mean, we can say something like that broadly, but I think we should be very careful uh, when using such terms to make them specific to what is intended. Naturally, yes, the um, reasoning behind that norm was to enable the fathering of a child when the wife couldn't have children for whatever reason. But we can't really consider <clears throat> that woman as a surrogate mother, that slave woman, first because surrogacy is connected to medical procedures that didn't exist at the time. So there conventionally the husband, her slave owner would just have sexual intercourse with her and try to conceive the child. Um, and secondly, we don't know who was considered to be the mother of the child. So we have no actual proof that the infertile wife was to be considered the mother which would be what we'd expect in the case of surrogacy. So this isn't really um, an objection to either Adina or Danica. I know you encountered such claims in the literature. They are present, but let's just simply be more careful. So we can consider such institutions as predecessors of surrogacy, but not really surrogacy as such. So, if there are no questions, uh, I would actually like to ask something, uh, each one of you actually. So, uh, Denisa and Darina, um, this is for both of you. Of course, if you have the um, information, yeah. Um, how is um, financing this artificial procedures, insemination procedures, how is it regulated both in Belarus and Czech Republic? Does the couple have to pay by themselves? Or is it paid by the state by medical insurance? If you know, of course, I mean, it's just uh, my curiosity. And then it's I will later, later address you. <laughs> uh, thank you for, uh, for the question. Uh, I will start if I may, if it's okay for Arena. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we have um, several cycles for women covered with the uh, health insurance in the Czech Republic. Uh, but it's limited uh, with age and with number of those cycles. I believe uh, two cycles are paid uh, via health insurance, uh, and there are also some health limits, such as that the women has to be between, I believe, 22 and 30 something years of age. Uh, it is basically bound to the possibility of success of artificial uh, of assisted of, of assisted reproduction. If the woman is, uh, for example, 48, 49, there is not much uh, possibility of it to be successful. So the state does not want to pay for this. Uh, if talking about uh, my country uh, in the Republic of Belarus, uh, not um, uh, uh, even maybe one year ago, it was uh, uh, possible to make one in vitro fertilization for free. So the government paid uh, for this attempt, but it's also limited uh, by uh, the age uh, of the woman. And uh, only one time they have uh, this attempt for free. Yeah, thank you very much for your answers. Now, Dan, it says for your topic, I just wanted to make a general comment that um, it's a very interesting topic and uh, I think it's very controversial now how that surrogacy should be regulated today because of many misuses. And um, as you said, the people can create a contract and then it's very easy that one side doesn't respect it. 
and what do we have as a result? We have a child which is born, you don't, you know, legally who is its parent, who, and the court cases last for a long time and until it's settled, it's, it's a mess. A lot of emotions are also there included. And just as you mentioned, the, the commercialization of it, it's a bit problematic because it, it's basically um, comes down to exploiting women from poorer countries who agree to being a surrogate mother, not maybe due to their wish to help a couple, but because they financially need the money, they need the money. <laughs> so just wanted to ask you, um, what do you think about this commercial surrogacy? Should it be like allowed? Should it be restricted? Should it be forbidden? Just your opinion. And also if the other two participants want to answer, feel free to join in. It's, I mean, it's an open question, so. <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, I agree with everything that you already um, mentioned. Um, I, I remember when I was researching this topic, I came across the fact that, uh, it's, I think UNICEF fact that 153 million of children are orphans. And um, I, I understand the, the idea of surrogacy in general, altruistic and commercial surrogacy. Um, it has its own good sides and bad sides. Um, on, on a good side, um, first of all, on a bad side, um, there is a good good amount of exploitation of a women and child without citizenship and many problems. Uh, but on the other side, um, a women's a women are not they're going to be exploited, um, and commercial surrogacy is uh, definitely bringing towards it even more. But I don't think it is uh, the main problem currently. So I, I generally think that, when, like I said, when I've seen that 153 million of children are orphans and uh, we have the option of adoption, uh, we have an option of adoption. Uh, so um, I don't really find service in general um, a lot of sense in it. I, I find a very sense in genetic connection, but uh, again, it's a philosophy of, of a family, how people are considering what is a family. So I don't think that children and parents have to have a genetic connection in order to feel like a family. So in that way, I I, I understand commercial surrogacy and altruistic surrogacy, but I'm not very um, I'm, I'm like against it in some way. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Uh, Nina, you raised the hand. <laughs> Sorry, me again, just briefly, since you mentioned the issue of so many orphans that nobody is adopting and here people are resorting to complicated and expensive medical procedures in order to get children, that is a really major subject that we could talk about separately. Uh, but the problem is, I don't remember the exact figures, there are statistics that can be found, but many of those orphans that are never adopted are frequently older children because childless couples usually want a baby or at least a very small child that they could raise completely as their own they don't want an eight-year-old let alone a 15-year-old and secondly uh, unfortunately many of those children are children who have serious health issues who are sometimes abandoned because their parents can't or won't take care of them under such conditions. And then, of course, it is much, much harder to find a family who would adopt. And I would also like to add that um, also legal framework regarding adoption, I think is a very uh, problematic, meaning that there are a lot of restrictions, which I don't think there that are necessary. Like, uh, for example, they're not allowing single parents, let's call it like that, single people to adopt. I, I don't know if it's in every country like that, but I think in our country, it kind of is. Like if I am a, a grown woman and I have a steady job, I have a house of my own, and then I can be denied to adopt just because I don't have a male partner. Um, I know there is this idea that the family should be uh, whole, let's say like that, that the best option for a child is to be adopted into a family where there is mother and father. But if there is no such kind of family, I think even a single parent is a better option than for a child to be left in the orphanage. And then there are other, you know, conditions. Uh, I know there is also issue that if a, a family wants to adopt a child, every child needs to have a separate room for for themselves. 
um, how many children we do know that live in their biological families that have to share rooms with brothers and sisters? Like, is that really a necessary condition for a child to be adopted? So there's a lot to discuss. So uh, apart from what Nina mentioned, I also think that like law should be a little bit changed to 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 take into consideration what's best for the child, because otherwise it's left in the orphanage and that's it. And just to add that. <laughs> So, any more comments, any more questions? Well, if not, I would like to take our, uh, to thank, not take, I'm sorry, to thank our participants for their presentations. They were very, very interesting. And um, now we'll have a bit of a break because our next sessions, if I'm not mistaken, it begins at one o'clock. And now we have a Serbian session again on reproductive rights, but uh, in Serbian. <laughs> Um, so thank you very much and uh, hopefully we see you next year, our foreign participants and uh, Danica also, and we will see each other after the break. Goodbye to all international Goodbye. participants and hopefully next year you come to Belgrade.